Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video we're going to learn more about the income statement. The topics I'm going to cover in this video are a high level explanation of the income statement, I'll show you a basic income statement, a little more complex one, where do the numbers come from, we'll look at Microsoft's income statement, and we'll talk about some more advanced topics and a summary. A company's income statement is a summary of their revenue and expenses over a period of time. So it could be over a quarter, a month, a year. So the very top of the income statement is their revenue. The bulk of the income statement, the next part is the expenses, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which is revenue minus expenses. So the company is profitable if revenue is greater than expenses. They're not profitable if revenue is less than expenses. The three main financial statements are the balance sheet, which are a company's assets, liabilities, and equity at a point in time, the income statement, the company's revenue, expenses, and profit, and the statement of cash flows, all the cash inflows and outflows over a certain period of time. Companies don't always call it the income statement. Some call it the P&L or the profit and loss statement, the statement of revenue and expense, the statement of operations, or the statement of financial results. If you see a report with revenue, expenses, and net income, that's the income statement, regardless of what they call it. So here's a really basic income statement. Your friend Ian owns a sub shop. It's called Ian Subs. And for the entire year of 2021, he shows you his income statement, revenue of 10,000, expenses of 7,000, and net income of 3,000. Not much information, right? The only thing we can figure out is his net income margin of 30%, which is net income over revenue, or 3,000 over 10,000. Since Ian is not a public company, he doesn't have to provide any detail to anyone. But Ian wants you to invest in his company. He asks for $3,000 to split the company 50-50. And you try to explain to Ian, I need more information, you're not providing much. Ian doesn't really know how to put together an income statement. And he just says to you, this is all I can provide. The revenue, expenses, and net income. But you ask Ian, let me at least see the income statement for your prior 3-4 years. You see four years ago, he had a net loss of 10,000. Three years ago, he broke even. Two years ago, he had a profit of 1,000. Last year, a profit of 2,000. Now it's a profit of 3,000. So you feel a little more comfortable investing in his company. And Ian says, it's a great investment. If I increase net income 1,000 a year, you're gonna make your money back in a few years. And I might increase net income more than 1,000 a year. Maybe I'll double it. Maybe it'll be 6,000 next year or 10,000. So you tell Ian, you're definitely interested, but you need more information. Ian says, what information do you need from me? And then you say, at least tell me what your variable and fixed costs are. And he says, what does that mean? And you say, well, variable costs is your labor, your employees. And he said, what's fixed costs? And you say, well, your rent is a fixed cost. Ian says, no, every year my rent goes up. So it's a variable cost. And Ian is right, his rent does go up every year. In reality, there is no such thing as a fixed cost. So you tell Ian a fixed cost is fixed in a certain accounting period, like a quarter or a year. And Ian says, oh, okay, that makes sense. But Ian still doesn't understand why you need all this information, just invest or not invest. So you tell Ian, roughly, what's the most revenue you can get in the space you have? For example, what's the max revenue next year? So he says, roughly 20,000 is my max revenue. You create this chart for Ian to show you why variable and fixed costs are important. Both of these charts are extreme examples, but you're just trying to prove a point. So Ian, if 100% of your expenses are fixed, pretend your rent costs $7,000. I know that's not possible, but let's just pretend you have no variable costs, it's all fixed. If you did grow to 20,000 revenue, net income would be 13,000 and then we could split $6,500 each. And then you show Ian, if 100% of your expenses are variable, I know that's not possible, let's just pretend you have no fixed costs. 100% of your costs are payroll and the food you purchase. So if your revenue maxed out to $20,000, your expenses would go up at a similar rate since they're all variable. So your profit would be $6,000. So in this case, in the most perfect situation, if you maxed out your revenue, I would just get my money back. And this is unlikely because everything has to go perfect. It's hard to max your revenue. 
So now Ian is starting to understand things. So you tell Ian, if you have most of your fixed costs covered, then I'll probably invest in your company. But if you have a ton of variable costs, I don't think it's worth it. Because after you cover all your fixed costs, a bulk of each dollar of additional revenue goes to the bottom line. But when you have really high variable costs, then only a small amount of each additional dollar of revenue goes to the bottom line. Let's look at a more complex income statement. Felipe's Diamond Import Company. They're a public company, so they have to report a lot more detail than Ian. They break out sales into two categories, diamond sales and non-diamond sales. They import diamonds and other products and then sell them to retail stores. And this is just for the first quarter of 2022. So they have $470,000 of sales in the first quarter from just diamonds. But that's not right. That's actually wrong because it says all numbers are in thousands except earnings per share. So it's actually $470 million. Most public companies list numbers in thousands or millions. Their non-diamond revenue is $130 million. So total revenue is $600 million. And the cost related to generating the $470 million is $205 million. The cost related to generating the $130 million is $75 million. So their total cost of sales is $280 million. And then they have operating expenses. These are expenses indirectly related to generating the revenue. Payroll is in both cost of revenue and operating expenses. If there's an employee that works in a warehouse that packages products up and ships them out to the customers, his salary is part of cost of revenue. But the accountant who works in corporate headquarters, his salary is in operating expenses. Same thing with rent, it could be in both places. And the rent of 25 million, that could be the rent for one location or many different locations. They have debt because they paid 1.9 million of interest on their debt. They had to purchase supplies of 1.1 million and they spend 800,000 on utilities like gas and electric. So total operating expenses are 97 million. Operating income, 223 million. Other income and expenses. Sometimes companies make money or lose money outside of their core business. This 30 million is a goodwill impairment. Felipe acquired a company a few years ago and they posted goodwill onto their balance sheet from that acquisition. But they're writing down the goodwill in this accounting period. They're writing down 30 million. So they reduced 30 million off their balance sheet and passed through a loss onto your income statement. And then income before tax is 193 million. Provision for income taxes. You'd see it says provision because the taxes on the income statement are calculated according to GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. The company pays taxes according to the IRS, and a lot of times they're different. The IRS may say the company has to pay 40 million in taxes. So they pay 40 million in taxes, and then the difference, 2.5 million, is carried on the balance sheet as a deferred tax liability. If the IRS said 38 million of taxes they had to pay, then they would post a deferred tax asset on their balance sheet. And a deferred tax asset and deferred tax liability reverses out sometime in the future. So their net income, their accounting profit is $151 million. They provide us their earnings per share of $1.08 and their diluted earnings per share of $0.94. Cents. The way you calculate basic earnings per share, it's net income over $140 million. And diluted earnings per share is net income over $160 million. If Felipe issued convertible debt to someone, then that person may convert that debt to equity and their basic earnings per share will increase. If the stock price shoots up a lot in a short period, then people are more likely to convert their securities to equity. But if the stock price stays pretty flat or goes down, then people are less likely to convert their securities to equity. So Felipe's income statement provided us a lot of good information. We can look at the margins for diamonds and the margins for non-diamonds. So the margins for diamonds are 56%. To calculate that, it's one minus, then in parentheses, 205 million, which is the cost of diamonds, divided by 470 million, which is the revenue from diamonds. 
So every dollar of revenue from diamond sales led to 56 cents of gross profit. Non-diamond gross margins are worse, 42%. You want higher margins, not lower margins. To calculate that, it's one minus, in parentheses, 75,000 divided by 130,000. Their operating margins are 37%, that's 223,000 over 600,000, which is operating income divided by revenues. As you get lower on the income statement, the margins usually decline. Then you have your pre-tax margin, which is income before taxes divided by revenue, that's 32%, and your net margins of 25%, net income divided by revenue. You want to compare these percentages to the last few quarters of Felipe and see if they're getting better or worse. You also want to compare these numbers to similar companies in their industry to see if they're better or worse. You notice something kind of odd. In the first quarter, Felipe generated 151 million of profit. And last quarter, they generated 125 million of profit. So you would assume the earnings per share would have went up because if they're generating more profit than last quarter, shouldn't the earnings per share also increase? The earnings per share in the first quarter were $1.08. Last quarter it was $1.25. And you wonder how could this even be possible? And then you look, they had only 100 million shares outstanding last quarter. They added a lot more shares in the first quarter. They're up to 140 million. So they diluted your holdings. Last quarter, even though the company made less money, your portion of that was more than this quarter. Because you can't assume a company's earnings per share will increase as their net income increases. It probably will, but it might not. If you're curious where a company gets the numbers, for the income statement, they get it from the trial balance. Every transaction is entered into the general ledger, and then at the end of a quarter or end of the year, they take the balance in each account and put it on the trial balance. So for Scott's Energy Company, the balance of cash at the end of 2021 was 35,600. The trial balance always starts with assets, then the next section is liabilities, then equity, but we can ignore these, that's part of the balance sheet. We'll just focus on the income statement. The next part is all the revenue. This company only has one revenue category of 50,000. So their revenue for 2021 is 50,000 and their expenses in 2021 are 10,000 plus 30,000. This company's net income for 2021 is $10,000. A trial balance is a really helpful tool to make sure your numbers tie. The sum of the debits has to equal the sum of the credits. And if it doesn't, then the bookkeeper has to go back into the software and fix whatever is incorrect. This is Microsoft's first quarter income statement. And if you go to the 10Q, next to the first quarter income statement, I think there's the first quarter of 2021. Most companies provide more information. I just showed you the first quarter so you can visually see it on this slide. So their revenue was 49 billion, cost of revenue 16 billion, their gross profit is 34 billion, so to calculate their gross margins, it's 34 billion divided by 49 billion. And they just list a few expenses, R&D, marketing, and general and administrative. They can't list every single expense. They need to consolidate all the numbers into various categories. So their operating income was 20 billion, their net income was 17 billion. And they give us their earnings per share and diluted earnings per share and shares outstanding. Just by looking at this, you can't really tell if they had a good quarter or not. It looks like they did well. That's a lot of revenue, almost 50 billion, and that's a lot of net income, almost 17 billion. But you have to compare it to prior quarters, and you also want to compare it to analyst targets and look at their competitors as well. Let me just give you an extreme scenario. Let's say their net income target was 25 billion and they only got 17 billion, and the stock went down and the company wasn't happy, investors weren't happy. Now let's pretend they sold LinkedIn in the first quarter. I know that's unlikely, but let's just pretend they sold it for $126 billion. They paid $26 billion. So they sold it for $100 billion more than they paid. That means they have to report a gain on other income and expenses of $100 billion. If their net income was $116 billion, would you say they had the best quarter ever? They crushed their target? No, because everyone knows their net income was inflated because of the sale of LinkedIn. Even if the company got a great price for the sale of LinkedIn, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. Because you don't invest in companies so they sell off their assets. Because eventually they wouldn't have a company. You invest in companies so they provide a product or service and make a profit off of that. 
Anytime you see something really big in other income and expenses, it's unlikely that's gonna occur in the future. If you owned a small flower shop in your town and you did about $100,000 of revenue and you had net income of 30,000 and you were happy, it paid the bills, you enjoyed your life, you would use cash accounting. When a customer bought something, that would increase your revenue. And when you paid for an expense, like you paid your employees, that would bring down your net income. But it's not always this way with accrual accounting. Public companies don't use cash accounting. They use the matching principle. It's possible to sell a product and receive lots of cash, but not book the revenue. Let me give you an example. Let's say you like to go to Starbucks. You go a couple times a week, you spend about 25 bucks a week. So you usually buy a $100 gift card. It lasts about a month. When you buy that gift card from Starbucks, you're giving them cash, but they're not gonna book any revenue because they cannot book the revenue until you use the gift card, until you actually buy a product. They put that $100 on their balance sheet in the liability section as unearned revenue. And every week you spend $25 at Starbucks, so they remove $25 from the liability section and put it onto the income statement as revenue. What if 10 million people did that this week? That's a lot of cash they're receiving, but they're not booking any revenue. And it's possible you spend money on something, but you don't report expenses on your income statement. What if you needed to buy a new truck for your moving business? Your other truck is getting old, so you buy a new truck for $50,000. You can't put $50,000 on your income statement. You need to put that $50,000 on your balance sheet and depreciate it, maybe over 10 years. So every year you would put $5,000 of an expense on your income statement. So a company can have negative net income and do really well for the quarter. For example, if they sold LinkedIn for $1 billion, they would have to report a loss of $25 billion. So they would have negative net income and they still might have done really well for the quarter because they could have generated lots of revenue and lots of profit. The loss on the sale of an investment is a non-cash item because the cash occurred years ago whenever you actually bought the business or bought the investment. Also, a company can report positive net income and have a terrible quarter. Like an example I gave you earlier, where they could have reported a huge gain because they sold LinkedIn for $126 billion. But if you strip out that sale of LinkedIn, they actually had a bad quarter. So to summarize, an income statement shows you a company's revenue, expenses, and profit. So it's just an overview of how the company's performing over a certain accounting period, whether it be a quarter or a year. But of course, the income statement is not the end all be all. It is the most common financial statement for an investor to look at because it makes the most sense. Some people also look at the balance sheet, but not that many people look at the statement of cash flows. But when you put all three financials together, you get a much better story than just the income statement. If you've been watching the video from the beginning, I thank you so much. Please like the video and subscribe. It really helps me out a lot. Thanks for watching.